I'm going to be talking to you about how to position ethical products. Can I just see a show of hands? How many of you here own or represent brands? Quite a few of you. And how many own or represent uh, retailers? Excellent, nice mix. So my talk is aimed both at both of you, so I hope you'll, you'll get some value out of this. So, so Sarah de, uh, defined ethical as something that is good for others. And um, for me, I think ethical does have different meanings depending on who you talk to. Um, as far as I'm concerned, so ethical is something which is good for or benefits people, animals and planet, which I think Sarah mentioned, which is fabulous. What I find is that a lot of businesses, a lot of brands, they're very good on the people side and on the environmental side. So they're very good at championing fair trade and you know, non-exploitative labor and getting all kinds of uh, environmental certifications. I'm gonna be perfectly honest and say I do think a lot of brands still have a major blind spot when it comes to animals. So the way I define ethical when it comes to animals, it's vegan. It's animal free, no animal ingredients, no testing of animals on raw materials or the finished product. So what I'm going to talk about today is how you can convey your ethical stance as a brand without coming across as preachy. Should you use the word vegan in your branding, marketing or packaging or is it better to use something like plant-based instead? And where should retailers position these products in their stores? Should they be in a separate channel, a section, or should they be amongst the animal-based products? So I just want to give you, just so we get a, a kind of picture of where we are, I just want to give you a couple of very quick statistics. The global meat substitutes market is expected to garner a revenue of $5.2 billion by 2020. That's only two years away. And vegan cheese is on the up and up. The global vegan cheese market is expected to be worth just under $4 billion by 2024. Now, you might be sitting there saying, look, these aren't very you know, huge figures in the scheme of things. I've been vegan for 21 years, and I can remember back 21 years ago, the choice of vegan cheese was very limited and they tasted like rubber. Um, so the fact that this is a really fast growing market I think is really exciting. Um, it's actually, I'm really surprised. I never thought that I would be cool and trendy, but in the past few years, suddenly it's happened. So there we go. Um, so those are just a couple of stats for you, just to give you an idea of where we are. If you want some more data, as I mentioned, I have a regular Forbes column and I specialize in writing about vegan and plant-based business. I did this article at the end of last year, um, how to, here's why you should turn your business vegan in 2018. Basically, it's a roundup of all the latest research, the data on the growth of the vegan and the plant-based sector, key players in the field. There's lots of links in there, so if you just go on to Forbes and type in Katrina Box, you'll see the column and you can actually get a whole load of facts and figures. I've literally collated them for you. So how do you convey your ethical stance without being preachy? This is the website of Miyoko's. It used to be called Miyoko's Kitchen. It's now rebranded to just Miyoko's. The founder is Miyoko Shina, she's in America. And as part of her rebrand, she's got right at the top of her website, phenomenally vegan. She's, I think you know, Miyoko's in either her late 50s or early 60s, and she recently got a tattoo on her shoulder with that on it, phenomenally vegan, and she Facebook lived it and got you know, heaps of views and what have you. But see how she's paired the word vegan, which is, you know, to be fair, it's got a lot of stereotypes and negativity attached to it. She's combined it with the word phenomenally. So those are two words that don't often go together. So it's immediately conveying something positive. She also has um, on her land a little um, rescue, uh, farmed animal rescue. So this is a picture of Erica, one of the cows that she rescues. And you can see here she's just got a little tagline, cashews not cows. So there's nothing on here that's ranting and raving and trying to convert people or trying to make people wrong. It's conveying these ethics in a really positive way. This I think is really interesting. So she describes, and we had our previous speaker, Tim Sperry, talked about um, how mission-driven businesses are becoming more and more popular with people. So the way Miyoko describes uh, their mission, she uses words like, so being vegan is the gold standard for the future of food. So again, it's getting people excited. She uses words like uh, the future of food that emphasizes artistry, integrity, ethics, and conviviality. So see how she's positioning integrity and ethics along with 
fun words like conviviality. So again, it's, it's creating these ethics in a really positive, the ethical stance in a really positive way. And at the end, she, just, she says, vegan is how we change the world together. See how inclusive that is. So again, it's not pointing and saying, you're wrong, you're doing this, you're bad. It's bringing people in. So I think that what Miyoko's doing, her ethics are very much for, you know, uh, first and foremost, um, everywhere in her branding, they're on the, the front of all of her packaging, but she's doing it in a, a positive way. Now, at the other end of the scale, we've got uh, Beyond Meat. So, some of you might have heard of Beyond Meat. It's the company um, that's started by a guy called Ethan Brown, and it's had major investors. Bill Gates from Microsoft, Leonardo DiCaprio are all investors in it. And what they've done is they've created these kind of next level. They're one of the leading players to create next level plant based burgers that bleed using beet juice. Um, and basically, they don't use the word vegan anywhere on their packaging. What what they do is they focus very much on plant-based and as you can see here they also focus on the fact there's no soy or gluten there's no GMOs and see how the image of the cow there very different to how Miyoko's done it that kind of almost looks like a, a logo that a butcher might use um, because they're targeting a very different market um, in terms of they want to get into, they want to get in front of mass market and in front of mainstream consumers. So they do have a little V on the back of their product, but basically you really wouldn't know unless, you know, you can see the word plant-based for sure, um, but everything, the, the burger looks like uh, a meat burger, it smells like it, it sizzles on it and everything, and it bleeds like it, and, and pretty much tastes like the real thing as well, or uh, meat products. So how you convey your ethical stance really depends on your mission and your market and who you're talking to. So with those two examples, it's interesting, you might think that, well, Miyoko's is obviously targeting the vegan community and most of their sales are going to come from vegans. Not so. I spoke to Miyoko um, recently and she told me that their sales in the past year alone increased by 300%. And she said to me, there literally isn't that many, even though the vegan uh, group is growing uh, considerably, which is wonderful, there's not yet, yet that many vegans to sustain that kind of growth. And she says that's reflected in a lot of the feedback they get from their customers on social media saying, look, I'm not vegan, but your vegan but your butter is amazing, it's the best. So I think that just, um, you know, in case you're thinking, because there is an argument that, oh, if you put the word vegan all over your branding, um, people who are not yet vegan think, oh, that product isn't for me, it's for vegans. So there is that argument and, and there is some validity to it, but I think that's also changing now and I think this has been evidenced um, with, certainly with Miyoko's brand. Also, so the word plant-based can be quite confusing. Now, for me, the word plant-based means it's made of plants and only plants. But the animal agriculture industries have begun to hijack the word, and now they're saying, oh no, it means it can mean mostly plants. Miyoko as well said to me that outside of America, a lot of people don't know what plant-based is, whereas they recognize the word vegan. So that's something to, to be aware of. Now, two years ago, literally two years ago this month, in April 2016, there were lots of these headlines in the Australian media saying go the Australians Google the word vegan more than any other country, more than people in any other country. So I thought it would be interesting to see what's happened two years later. So this is from Google Trends data. So Google Trends data for the word vegan this year, April 2018, Australia, still the number one more Australians still Googling the word vegan. I also looked up go uh, vegan meat. Australia, number one, more Australians Googling the term vegan meat. Same for vegan cheese, Australia, number one, yay. Now, here's what happened when I typed in plant-based, just the word plant-based, and I did this with and without the hyphen, so that's without the hyphen, but I did also check it with. Australia is not even in the top five. When I typed in plant-based meat and plant-based cheese, there's not even enough data for any countries within Google Trends um, analysis. So I think that's something to, to be aware of in terms of the words that you're going to be using. So again, I did an article on Forbes, which goes into much more discussion. It shows the pros and the cons. You can check that out, should your business use the word vegan in its branding or marketing. Um, so feel free to check that out if you want more of the, the pros and cons and a bit more of an in-depth discussion on that. 
Personally, I believe it is worth covering all bases. Um, so, for example, with Beyond Meat, as you saw, they just go with plant-based and the word vegan isn't anywhere. I think it's really important to just put a very discreet, small, something on the back, whether it's if you've gone and got your products vegan certified by the Vegan Society in the UK or Vegan Org in the US, just put it somewhere subtly on the back or the word vegan or vegan friendly or suitable for vegans. I know as a consumer, when I go into a store and if I buy a packaged food, I turn it over, I look at the ingredients and I think to myself, well, it, it could well be vegan according to the ingredients, but if that brand has actually gone to the trouble of having a vegan certified certification or telling me this product is for you, I instantly feel warm towards it and it's far more likely to go into my basket than if I'm just having to guess, well it looks like it's vegan. So I think there's a way that you can actually appeal to all. You can appeal to the mainstream consumers but you can also let those that are looking for something ethical uh, by putting it discreetly on the back. And I think that also goes for things like gluten-free or you know, low sugar for people who are, are diabetes. People really like the fact, as I think Sarah uh, talked about in, in her talk, um, is that people do, you know, they want to know that these are your ethic or that this product is for them and that you share values. So where to position, where should we put these products in retailers? So they've traditionally been placed in some kind of speciality section. So it could be the free from aisle, or the natural, or the healthy, or the veg section. And of course the argument is that for those consumers who are looking for these types of products, they go into the supermarket, they go straight to this one section, they go along with their trolley or their basket, and they can pick up a whole different uh, number of products and, and do their shopping. So it's a fairly valid argument. However, there is a drive at the moment in the US which is being led by companies like Beyond Meat to actually stock these products alongside meat-based counterparts in the meat and dairy sections. Now, I spoke to Ethan Brown a couple of weeks ago um, on the phone and he's given me some, some information which I'm sharing with you today. What he said was, it's still nowadays, it's generally more women uh, do the menus for the, and the shopping for the food for their families. So they might, when they're planning, they might go, right, on Tuesday we're going to have sausages, on Wednesday we'll have burgers, on Thursday we'll have fish fingers, what have you. So basically when she goes into the store, she goes into the supermarket, she's going to go to the protein department to get the burgers or the sausages or, and the fish fingers, and that's where they want their products to be. He actually refers to the speciality sections as the penalty box because it's forcing these women who have not got a huge amount of time, women, women and men of course, you know, they're going in and, and they've got their protein and now they've got to schlep to a whole other side of the, the supermarket for these speciality products. So they want to actually be, be in front of those, those um, customers. So another figure for you, so in the US, the plant-based milks, this is a quote from Alison Rabschnuck from the Good Food Institute in the US, and she said, look, in the US, plant-based milks used to be tucked away somewhere, you know, in one of the specialist aisles, um, and now they're sold in the refrigeration sections alongside dairy, and they comprise 10% of the market. Now again, this might not seem big right now, but again, 21 years ago, I'm from the UK, you can probably tell by my accent, I used to go to shop in Sainsbury's. The only choice of plant-based milk was uh, soya milk sweetened with apple juice or soya milk unsweetened. That was it. That was the only choice of plant milk that we got. And now, you know, we've got cashew milk, uh, almond milk, rice milk. We've got such a huge range. So I think it's really worth noting where we are and, and how fast this, this market is actually growing. So in terms of positioning them in retailers, it really does depend on who you want to target. So, you know, there are brands, for example, like Tofurky, which have just come over here into some of the, I think it's Woolworths, um, into the big retailers. They're actually quite happy in the natural, the healthy channel, and they're doing, you know, decent enough sales. Um, but if you are a company like, you know, Beyond Meat or some of these uh, dairy product, vegan dairy products that are coming out now, then you may well want to be, um, be stocked alongside those animal-based products. So look, we are in the early stages of this. I mean, Beyond Meat is a startup, um, but there are some promising figures. So when I spoke to Ethan Brown uh, uh, two weeks ago, he said out of all the grocery stores of one major retailer in the US, in their Southern California division, 
He couldn't tell me the name of the retailer because the retailers don't allow that to be divulged. But it wasn't Whole Foods, it wasn't some kind of speciality or independent store. It was a major mainstream retailer. The uh, Beyond Meats, Beyond Burger was the number one beef selling patty in the meat case. So not just the number one veggie burger or whatever, the number one beef selling patty in the meat case. That's pretty cool bananas, I was really happy with that. Um, and Beyond Meat sales um, doubled last year. They would have done more, except they literally um, don't have the processing capacity because they're still in startup mode. And the demand has just been phenomenal. Um, but they will double again this year. Just Mayo used to be called Hamptons Creek and then they did a rebrand. So they produce a lot of eggless products like um, mayonnaise. And they had recent point of uh, sale data, retail data, shows that Just Mayo is the only 30 ounce growing in the grocery department, in the uh, grocery category. And at a top three national retailer, Just Mayo leads growth in the 30 ounce category. So again, selling more than dairy-based uh, products. Also, I haven't got the slide on because this literally came on my radar like yesterday. Um, there's a company in the US called Don Lee Farms and they produce both meat products, meat food like burgers and sausages and what have you, and vegetarian and vegan products. They told me that they, the sales of their, they've got an organic plant-based burger. They said in the last 60 days, less than 60 days, they sold more than one million organic plant-based burgers in Costco in the US. In, in Costco is like, you know, really just like major mainstream chain. So I think these figures are really quite fascinating, quite heartening and give us an idea of where we're going and particularly because Australia does tend to follow US trends. Just to give you an idea on price, so Beyond Meat products at the moment, because they're a new startup and they're using all this new technology to make the burgers and the sausages and their other products as realistic as possible to animal-based um, food products, um, at the moment they're, they're priced on a par with premium um, organic grass-fed uh, beef and that kind of thing. But Ethan said in within five years, they price-wise, they're going to be on a par with just your bog standard uh, burgers and sausages, etc. So in terms of where these products should be placed, at the moment right now, it could well be for certain products, they, they quite happily stay in that natural channel. Um, but I think as we start to get more products coming into the market now, like Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burger is another big one in the, the market. They're focusing at the moment on food service and restaurants, but they'll soon be coming into retail. There are other products coming into retail. I think we're gonna start to see a shift and retailers will need to have a think about you know, considering placing them alongside uh, the meat-based products. Um, I think retailers do as well need to be more flexible and I, uh, in listening to brands. I think in the past it was very much the retailer dictated, right, this is where your product's going and that's it, no negotiation. I've done a lot of interviews with brands, with uh, particularly plant-based brands, um, and a lot of them have said that retailers are, particularly in the US, they're certainly becoming a lot more flexible now in where they're willing to stock these products. Um, and I think that we'll, we'll see that trend continue. What I think would be kind of quite cool, and I don't know how feasible or viable it is, but certainly I think it would be interesting to do some experimentation whereby um, you sell in the same store to sell the product, part some, some, uh, put some of the products in the speciality section and some of them in the meat-based section and see which fly off the shelves uh, more. I say I don't know how viable that is because I know in retailers shelf space is um, you know, very um, precious, but I think that will be, be an interesting thing to do and I think there's going to be a, a push for, for that kind of thing to collect that kind of data. So yeah, I hope that's given you a little bit of a helicopter ride. I know it's quite a quick um, talk, a little bit of a helicopter ride about where we are on ethical products and in particular uh, vegan and plant-based products.